From KSMQ in southern Minnesota, this is Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Lark Toys to me is very magical. There's something special about it. And as far as the toys, there's a lot of love. And seriously, there is. It's not just a manufactured thing that you're stamping out. There's, there's care, you know, and I've, that's, that's what I love. I like wooden food, <laughs> which sounds kind of crazy, but we have a tea party section and uh, a lot of wooden food and they can make all kinds of food for grandma and grandpa. You won't find many toys in here that have batteries, for instance. We try to stay unplugged in, in that way. We try to have toys that are very interactive that uh, kids can take apart and put together. The thing here, you can be creative. So, I mean, if we want to start creating new toys, it's awesome. I mean, it's wide open. We can do whatever we want. If we, if we come up with an idea, we'll sketch it out and we'll have a new pole toy. We've got such great educational and developmental toys that are just real long-lasting and good for the whole family. And the, of course the Lark toys. They're the, the highlight and how Lark got started. It's made locally. It, it's not something from you know, far away. It, it's right here, Minnesota made. And uh, that's a big draw and a big source of pride. What I'm amazed with, even after working with wood this many years, is to be able to just take a flat piece of wood and a few hours later you have a, a pull toy. I love seeing families enjoy one another, taking a few deep breaths and having some time together. One of my earliest and fondest memories is of my mother playing the piano for church when I was just a small child. Yeah, I remember she picked me up at school the last day of first grade and told me that she had a surprise and that I was starting piano the next day and I loved it ever since. My name is Bethany Hagen and I'm an 18 year old pianist. Just seeing relatives play, especially my mom and dad, um, I just wanted to follow in their footsteps. In Christina's 10th grade. I don't know, I find piano really rewarding. All the family members, my great grandparents, grandparents, parents, my older sister, they had all played the piano and I just wanted to be as good as them. goes to RCLS, Rochester Central Lutheran, and she's in the fifth grade. My name is Mary and I'm a 10-year-old piano player. I started playing because my sisters did it and I thought they were so cool, so. just like them because they were awesome. I guess as much time and effort as we've poured into piano, I'm pretty happy to say. I'm Julianne Hagen and I'm a piano mom.
I'm interested in exploring different ways of looking at artwork. It's not what you see that is important to me, it's how you see it. The artwork means nothing if the audience did not interact with it. Since I was young, um, like about seven years old, my parents um, are so afraid that I might go into fine art. They don't want to encourage me to make it into a career. So uh, my mom would throw away some of my artwork, pretty much um, want me to find an area that I can find, um, a study that I can find a job. One of the um, area that they want, they encourage me to explore is computer science. Uh, anyone who has worked with the multiple screen will know that quite often when they work on a project, they open two separate windows side by side on two separate screens. Even though the information is different, but they are related. So that's what I'm trying to present in the art form, trying to relate that scientific elements back into art form where we don't need to paint one scene in one canvas, we can paint it in multiple canvas and depict the differences and variations of what art can be. My goal of my artwork, hope that it will constantly be a good, good adventure for me. And I see the future is a blank slate, you know, like, you know, I will have to, I don't want to predict it, then it's not adventure anymore. So artwork is like an adventure for me. So I want to and create something that is, can constantly um, feel me to, to be alive. director of the middle schools in Rochester. Fast! Open the curtain fast, please. I've done a high school here and there, but mainly I'm directing with the middle school age kids. Everybody's getting ready for their entrance. Do you know what? For Farmer and the Cowman. I started when I lived in LA, and I did several plays for about a year, and then I moved here. I got my teaching degree, and then I started teaching. Ready? I was a painfully shy teenager, and I didn't start doing theater until I was in high school. And it was like, it, it was like a, I don't know how to explain it other than I, I wanted to do more and more and more. It became a passion to be involved with theater even if it was just in the chorus. It was just so fun. It was such an amazing experience. Cowboys dance to the farmers, farmers, farmers dance to the ranchers, cattle. I feel blessed. I feel so blessed to be able to work with the kids that I work with. It's a fabulous feeling to see them go from where they start out and then grow. I learn something all the time. I learn because all kids are different, all actors are different. Forever until I drop dead on stage. That's, that, I think that would be the perfect thing. My last breath. <laughs> My name is Mary Solberg and I'm a visual artist. I've always had an aptitude for art. You can kind of go into the area that you etched. It's just always what I really wanted to do. It's almost a compulsion, I would have to say. It's kind of like being in the zone. I try to get in the studio every day that I can, that I'm able to. You know, it feels really great. Time goes by, passes, um, and it's, it's just a very, the process itself is, is just really gratifying.
I'm definitely a portrait artist. I, I think that the eyes tell a lot. I think, the, you know, it's a, it's a very obvious way to express an emotion because, you know, a face does give you a lot of information. I would say my portraits are more about a psychological impact. I call them everyday icons, various people from my life or historic people. I think there's sacred in all of us, and so it's my way of sort of venerating, you know, just the everyday person. A lot of my images are um, obviously based on sort of religious iconography, and but they're about, some of them are tongue in cheek, obviously. It's a self-portrait of myself as Eve. It's, um, it's called Another Bad Decision. Art takes so many different forms, and you know, I, a person that even appreciates art can probably do art. Uh, it's just a matter of finding out your own, your own language. We always farm together. Well, we kind of, kind of had no choice but got stuck into farming, right? I suppose. <clears throat> That's what we were doing, so we kept on. Well, we ha had plenty of chores. You had, it took a half a day, every day, to just to do the chores and clean out the barn. If it was, it was too cold for the dog, we, we didn't go out in the field either. <laughs> One time, believe it or not, we. The dad had had a thrash machine and, and we had a John Deere B with lights on and a big two-wheel trailer that hold a lot of bundles and we kept going out there, but as the moon was shining for the tractor and the, and the thrash machine, so you could see there, pretty good, but we, we kept going out and get bundles and wasn't done, didn't get them all, the last one picked up till two o'clock at night. It's rash two o'clock. <laughs> and then we had to go home and do milk and do the chores. We're the Minnesota twins. Yeah, sometimes I say he's Minneapolis and I'm St. Paul. We always lived in Minnesota, so <laughs> I said we're the Minneapolis I mean the Minnesota. And, the, and then this is the gopher state. We go for this and we go for that. <laughs> some some didn't think it was good old days, but uh, I didn't think it was so bad. <laughs> I know you had to work. Yeah, you might get tired. You never quite retire. I feel, you know, I need to do art is just, uh, it's part of me. It's, I have a passion to do it. That urge to do good art, I think, you know, is just something that uh, was with me from a young, young child. Drawing and painting people is probably the ultimate challenge in art, particularly if you're working in a realistic fashion. This is a painting that Seems to be everybody's favorite. Uh, was done in '91. Uh, I call it the white shirt conversation. This is a large oil that I I did. Uh, I have a pond behind my studio, and uh, two of my nephews and one of their friends uh, were in a canoe in the in the pond. It was a hot summer day, and they were rocking the canoe and, until it would go over and then they'd get in and push e each other out of the canoe. I call this boys of summer. I, I don't try and sensationalize uh, the, uh, the images. I really think that the most timeless images are, are just of ordinary people doing ordinary things. I just had a, a wonderful interest in, and uh, 
wanted to do art, and, and, uh, but I've learned most everything. And so for those who don't think they can do it but want to try, just go ahead and take class. Get out there and try it. Band music is fun. If the bandstand is the crown of, of the community, the brass band is the jewel in that crown. The Chatfield Brass Band in, in this community, I think, has a special, special place. My father um, was Jim Perkins, who started the brass band in 1969 and the brass band Free Music Lending Library shortly after that. My dad uh, decided that Chatfield needed to have an area band. And so what he did is he grabbed some old high school yearbooks and looked at people, looked for pictures of people that he knew, sent him a note saying, hey, show up at band practice Thursday night. So once they created the band, then the biggest challenge was sheet music. They had to add music to play. But where do you find it? Where do you find that music? In these filing cabinets. This is a library of mostly band music. We lend the, the actual paper music out to bands and individuals all over the world. This library is an incredible resource with literally tens and tens of thousands of compositions of almost every imaginable nature. It basically becomes part of one big story, the American melting pot music story of different music from different cultures. Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, one man, a vision and a, and a dream. And he's been gone almost 20 years and just to really see this thrive and live on, it's just very worthwhile. And I think he really found joy in that. You know, just filling lives and communities full of music is what a great gift to do. What a great legacy to leave behind. definitely want art that appeals to your patient population, that's more uplifting than maybe depressing, that's maybe more enlightening than dark. When you walk into a facility, you're looking for things that are pleasing to the eye, that catch your attention, that refocus many of your concerns, um, particularly if you're coming in with a, a serious illness and need something a little bit more uplifting, friendly, and uh, something that helps you through uh, your particular situation. We were a little concerned that patients may not accept um, some of the art or may not accept the local nature or may be indifferent to it, that we would go through all this work and effort to promote the local artists and not get any response. Um, so we've been pleasantly surprised that patients have been very appreciative and very vocal. I hear that from staff and from patients all the time. A little more uplifting, a little more friendly, more colorful, more inviting. When, when I look at a piece of art that, you know, is, is really colorful and, and uplifting, it makes me happy. And so I think that um, any time, and, and I am a firm believer that if, you're, if you have a, a better mood, that you're going to be able to heal better. So I just really think that that's important in the healing process is, um, you know, improving the moods of the patients, and I think the artwork really will help to do that.
I am a native Minnesotian, as those of us from the time period of the 1860s refer to ourselves. I'm a writer. I had family who was involved uh, in the Civil War in Iowa, Wisconsin, and also in the Dakota conflict here in Minnesota. So I've kind of always grown up with the, the Civil War period. And I write historical fiction from different time periods. Part of why I write is to include the stories of my ancestors. My father was in World War II. My own father never shared his experiences until I came home from Navy boot camp, at which time he brought me in and he said, now you're part of, and he even used the word, the brotherhood. And now you're, you're in the military, and I, you're gonna be the keeper of the stories. For Northern Colors, that was my first novel. My newest book is called The Boys of Wasioja. It's about 68 men from Dodge County that enlisted and formed Company C of the 2nd Minnesota, fought through the war. Probably the largest part of my passion is to go into schools. I was the postmaster of Denison, Minnesota, and the husband of one of the late, one of my customers, taught at an elementary school. And I was talking to her one day, and she said that her husband his class was studying the Civil War, and did I know anybody that could come in and maybe talk about the Civil War? I said, well, I can come in and talk about it. So I put together a real, real terrible <laughs> Confederate infantry uniform and went in barefoot and dirty and stinky, and the kids absolutely loved it. And you can really get them with history if it becomes real to them. Go on the internet. If you search Civil War, you will get about four and a half billion websites. That's more than enough to, to start digging into it. Go to a library. Every, I, don't, I can't picture a library in America without at least one book on the Civil War at, at every level of reading. So, um, and maybe mine's in there. You could read that. Some person might think of it as grotesque. I think of them as beautiful. I love the curvilinear forms of bones. Um, I love the teeth. I, I've always made art, probably since my feet hit earth. When I'm in that situation, that's when I'm happy. I am very fortunate. I live with a neurosurgeon who works at Mayo Clinic who has been in a total support system for me. He's um, given me the uh, go ahead to do anything I wanted. I'm a very fortunate artist in that regard, you know, and I, it's something I never take for granted. So I've been able to do what I wanted to do and make art full time for all these years. Right now, this is a very beginning point of how I'm gonna make this into a really nice piece. You know, I've gotta spend a lot of time on it to get, to get that because there are elements about it that I love. This piece is called hydrangea. The hydrangea is made out of cow teeth. I like change in my life. I don't want it in my marriage, but I want it in my life, and my studio has always been about change. With this work, I mean, I'm really talking about mortality, and I'm talking about celebration of life, you know, two very opposite things. In this work in particular, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer and I uh, was ready for change. I became more introspective, I started paying attention to things, I sort of slowed down my speed, I was more meditative in the way I was looking at things and I knew that I was on to major change. When I'm in that situation, that's when I'm happy. talk about dairy farmer milk and a cow by hand. All you need is a good set of hands and a pail and a stool. This particular cow here will probably give right close to five gallons of milk. You don't want to go just flying right in there. You want to go in there carefully or talk to the cow a little bit so, so you don't scare them. <clears throat> Otherwise, there's a good chance you'll get kicked. 
We're gonna milk this cow by hand and the best thing to do on the way in is touch him on the side uh, and then I'm gonna take a alcohol wipe like people use and wash off her teats and massage her out a little bit and within a couple minutes her milk will be there ready to be milked. Just put your hand on there and then you gotta squeeze it. Squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release. Milking a cow by hand is harder than one thinks. So you have to squeeze pretty good. Pretty good. You gotta have a pretty good grip in your hand to get the milk to come out. Some cows milk a lot easier than others. And those with smaller teats are harder to milk if you have a big hand, so not much there to grab onto. You'll know when the cow is milked out because you'll run out of milk. The milk will quit coming out. My name is Gene Anderson. I'm a dairy farmer from Sargent, Minnesota. And I know how to milk a cow by hand. And I hope now that you know how to milk a cow by hand. That's it for now, but join us again next week for Off 90. Meanwhile, let us know what you think and tell us about any interesting people, places, or stories that you want to see here in the coming weeks. Then watch for the KSMQ crew out there, around your town, in our communities, along the back roads. Wherever arts, culture, and history can be found in southern Minnesota, that's where we'll be. But you can be sure we'll always be Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.